Hello and welcome to the Swine Disease Reporting System report. This is uh, report 25, uh, covering information up until February 2020. My name is Daniel Linhares at Iowa State. Hello, my name is Giovanni Trevisan from Iowa State. Hello, my name is Edison from Iowa State. And we have a special guest here today. Hello, I'm Kent Schwartz from the Diagnostic Lab at Iowa State. Thanks for having us with uh, with us uh, th this edition, Dr. Schwartz. Happy to be here, sir. All right. So we will start as usual here in the PERS page, which uh, it, uh, it covers detection of PERS RNA by PCR. And uh, Giovanni, long story short here from all those plots, what I see is that the detection of PERS by PCR in February is uh, lower compared to January, and it's really within the, pred uh, the, the pred prediction uh, bands. And so, what else? What else in this in this page? And what do we get from the advisory board for this relatively quiet first season so far? The advisory board comments are that the first virus detection is lower this year. It's because of a group of reasons. As example, we are having the a warmest winter compared with previous years that is bedded by security and transport sanitation practice mm -hmm. in the field being occurring. There are systems that are segregated trailers for south farms and wind to market animals. And there is new technologies that entered in the uh, swine practice in the last few years, like more use of feeder meat guns to uh, contain some virus, the air filtration technology, and PERS vaccines that have been used, all of those are helping to contain the spread and detection of PERS virus. So a combination of immune management, herd immunity, biosecurity, biocontainment? Yes, that was the reason that was pointed out. Okay, well, Dr. Schwartz, what's your take on when you see those those charts, those trends over time with your experience, what you've seen over the years, how, what, uh, what, what's your take on this page for PERS information? Well, I either want to dig deeper into the nuances or back up and look at trends. And I think the value of this data will be looking at trends over time, at least one of the values. And I, I'm encouraged to see the general trend downward in uh, percentage of positive cases over time. Mm -hmm. um, it, it gives me hope that our biosecurity is actually being executed and having an impact, probably not only on PERS occurrence, but other diseases as well. One, one of the questions that comes up from a, from a granular point of view would be, I wonder what the impact of vaccine detection will be and whether your system will be able to sort out uh, with the clamp technology that's out there now and the differential for vaccine whether this system will be able to sort that out and either put it in or take it out of your of your trends. Uh, so that's, that's one thing to be thinking about as we go forward is the more data we have, the, uh, the greater the chance we're able to ask better questions. Yeah, it's a good point. Because for PERS, we, today we report here the PCR results and we report our FLP results. Right. Uh, ha having uh, increased use of the clamp technology will be good to start reporting. For those cases where people are seeking that uh, clamp technology, what's the, what's, what's the percentage of cases coming back as vaccine life versus wild type, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Give you a little more accurate view of the true wild type impact of PERS out there. All right. Anything else, anybody, on this first page? All right. Uh, jumping here to the detection of enteric coronaviruses by, by PCR. Uh, pretty much the same story here uh, in the sense that the, the, the detection rates are following the, the expected or the forecast parameters, and they are uh, also uh, uh, relatively here going down quite compared, compared to previous years. Uh, and no detection at all of, of TGE virus. Uh, Giovanni, what else do you hear from the advisory board or any other highlights from this page? Uh, there is no doubt that more testing of wind market animals have been done for monitoring of PED and Delta coronavirus to understand what is the real scenario out there for these agents. Different systems have been reporting this uh, use of this PCR uh, testing to do that. 
but else there is more activity of the virus in winter market animals reported by the advisory council. They believe that there is an increased environmental contamination that helps for lateral outbreaks and as winter market animals has farms has less biosecurity measures when compared with the south farms and at the same time there is opportunity for lower compliance on biosecurity sanitation. This has been helping to spread the virus among wheat market farms. So w one of the challenges for the industry is really to improve the biosecurity in winter finish sites, right? To keep the virus down and, and uh, kind of bio-contain bi them there, preventing them to circle back to the south farms. Dr. Schwartz, what, what are your, your comments about this, uh, well, it, the coronavirus in general? We're, we're looking at a relatively short period of year-over-year -year data, again, longer-term trends, but um, and it may be simply weather. That, that is a big impact mm -hmm. in the upper Midwest here. But, mm -hmm. uh, again, I'm encouraged that the general trend for PED detection is going down, and I think... I think that's a good barometer for how well our biosecurity systems are being developed and implemented, which could be really important long term should we have a foreign animal disease outbreak, the ability to actually do what we say we do. Mm -hmm. So I'm very encouraged by the trend. I just look forward to having more data to compare year over year. Over year. And that, and this, and talking about TGE here again, zero detection over over uh, uh, three uh, thousand tests performed. That's that's uh, that's a good sign for the industry, right? Yeah, good I think of time. you know if, if we had excellent biosecurity, TGE would eradicate itself. Mm -hmm. It's almost there and has been since PED was introduced into this country. So it may be just a formality going forward to to say that we're negative for TGE. Good point. All right, moving on to the mycoplasma hyaluronic page and its detection by PCR. And same thing here that we discussed about PERS and the coronaviruses. Mycoplasma trends coming down as predicted by this time of the year and really in the center of the, the, prediction, the prediction curve. Dr. Schwartz, what are your, what, what's your take on this mycoplasma page? Well, um I guess I first need to differentiate detection versus disease uh, diagnosis. Uh, from a detection standpoint, much of the mm -hmm. mycoplasma is, is probably uh, being tested for surveillance or monitoring because um, most of our non-tissue samples probably aren't the best to try to implicate it as a, a disease. So to, to me, this is indicating uh, that there's considerable amount of testing going on, or at least it hasn't gone down, and that, uh, uh, you know, mycoplasma fits a seasonal pattern. Does it follow flu and PERS, or does it contribute to flu and PERS, and what impact that organism is actually having on the animal's health uh, probably can't be discerned from this graph, but might be when we start talking about our disease diagnosis uh, DX code monitoring system. Yes, and that's a great transition to the disease diagnosis reports system. Uh, this this page here, different than the other, the, the previous pages were all about PCR detection, and this page here is about disease diagnosis by the I Iowa State uh, diagnosticians, and that's all following the work that Dr. Schwartz has been building over the years in an effort to establish the diagnostic codes where the diagnosticians assign a code to, to all the cases they, they see. And from those codes, we, we understand what are the diseases in each of the physiologic systems. And uh, what we see here this month in the report is that PERS continues to lead the, the respiratory cases, rotavirus is leading the enteric cases, and streptococcus suis leading the nervous um, cases, and so we we'll certainly want to uh, he, uh, uh, hear more from Dr. Schwartz on what uh, led to, to this uh, development of the disease diagnosis and what what are the 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 uses, the benefits, the implications for for the vet veterinarians in the field and their cases. 
Well, yeah, thank you. Uh, I've been a bit passionate about diagnostic reports that either get used or thrown away. And, and over the last 35 years, I'm guessing most of mine have been thrown away. But I'd like to think there's a little bit of data in those reports that could be good for monitoring uh, disease occurrence, specifically disease occurrence, not just presence of agents um, over the years. And so the code coding system we've modified to um, be able to differentiate by system, CNS versus enteric, mm -hmm. for example, uh, by insult type, uh, virus versus bacteria versus parasite versus toxin and others. Um, and for the pathologists among us, what tissue did we look at? Where did we see a lesion? What was the lesion? So there's a third category for, for coding that. And of course, the fourth category would be uh, what was the actual agent or etiology detected if there was one. And so each case can have one or more diagnostic codes, particularly when we're talking about polymicrobial diseases. We implemented this system last June. So uh, previous diagnostic codes were reassigned to the new system, which would have some variation and error associated with it. But going forward from June of 2019, we hope uh, we're getting a little more accurate all the time. I think it's important that these DX codes are based on tissue submissions where we actually get a chance to evaluate the history, the clinical context, uh, what are the observed or reported gross lesions, uh, microscopic lesions, and then align that with laboratory results to come up with one or more uh, diagnoses for the case. And I think it's important to realize that many of the agents we detect with our detection methods are endemic. Uh, the question of whether they're causing disease or not is, is always an issue. Uh, and so that's where the histopathology or diagnostician's input is pretty important to establishing causation, if you will. Uh, part of the problem, too, is we don't test for everything. Uh, sometimes we're limited in the amount of testing we do, so our DX codes uh, should represent what's there today that we found or were allowed to find, but may not be the entire story, so to speak. So there's some downsides here but that we're uh, continuing to improve. Um, I think it's important to realize that every agent that we have that's causing disease has its own ecology, its own uh, immunology, uh, variation within organisms, cross-protection, uh, may or may not be predictable. Uh, the virulence can vary between individual isolates or, or organisms. Uh, so there's a lot of variation. I, if I had one word to express as our nemesis in the profession, it would be the word variation. And so as you think about that, what does that mean? That means our detection uh, is going to favor organisms that hit and stay. What do I mean by that? PERS virus hits and stays for a really long time, you know, months. Mycoplasma hits and stays for a very long time, months. Uh, PCV234, whatever, hits and stays within a population for a very long time, may or may not be causing disease during that time. In contrast, things like influenza virus, are present in an individual animal for a relatively short time, 10 days or less. In the population, well, that depends on the ecology and herd immunity, uh, how many viruses are out there and all that sort of thing. So there's, there's a lot of variation to be thinking about as we start trying to evaluate DX codes, but I think over time DX codes are going to give us the chance to look at disease trends. Another concept I think is important uh, is, is, you know, what the role of DX codes will be. When we have new diseases in the laboratory, new discoveries, and I would use strep equi subspecies zoepidemicus or PED or Seneca virus as examples, when we have those new diseases that hit a laboratory, it usually takes about a week for us to figure out this is new and this is important in the laboratory. By the time it filters through the regulatory folks and all that sort of thing, it may take longer. 
But there's no way we're going to predict that or have real-time uh, reporting of that type of, of situation. Uh, I think we rely on the swine vine, so to speak. It's a small profession to uh, make sure the word gets out that, hey, we just found this disease, maybe we should be looking for it. You know, the next level would be emerging diseases, things like Cepilovirus or Sapovirus, Teshovirus, some of these viral agents that are being either renamed or rediscovered or discovered for the first time. Those, I think, this system will have an excellent uh, ability to detect whether the prevalence of these things are increasing, staying the same, or if it's going to be a flame out. Diagnose a few times and it goes away. And then, of course, re-emerging disease will have a way to keep a pulse on, on uh, you know, changing, changes in swine dysentery was a great example. The Salmonella 4512 versus Typhimerium are examples. We can, we can aggregate those trends. Hopefully, going forward, we'll also be able to aggregate polymicrobial diseases like PRDC. How many cases has the aggregate or your particular system had where PERS and flu are present, not mycoplasma, where mycoplasma and APP are present, but not PERS, and be able to ask some of those more comp complicated questions uh, to better monitor disease occurrences in herds. I guess the another major consideration is disease diagnosis is heavily dependent on the quality of samples that are received by the laboratory. Uh, as you know, populations, 2,400 pigs, are moving through time with a distribution of parameters, different types of parameters. Uh, we're mostly interested in the lagging tail of those distributions. Within those lagging tails are sick pigs and mortalities. Uh, the question is, uh, can you or your associates pick out the right pig to represent 2,400 head? Uh, and is the permutation of agents detected in a pig or two pigs uh, the same as what be occurring in the population? Uh, multifactorial disease, does it matter which agent comes first? Uh, are impacts of, of infection with different agents cumulative? These are all questions I think we need to answer going forward uh, to better understand disease ecology and, and what types of interventions are more likely to work. Uh, there's a tendency to blame mortality on the last agent that's found, the proximate cause of death, so to speak. But we all know there's, there's myriad risk factors and other agents that led up to that event in that animal, wherever he happens to lie within the distribution that's moving through time. I better stop there because I'm getting a little carried away. <laughs> I would think that, that was that, that was great, and so if if I understood right, uh, the 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 veterinarians, their associates, they send tissue, okay, they they send tissues, and the diagnosticians work on that, and so all great. It helps to understand what's going on at that specific flow at that specific point in time, and now with the diagnostic codes, what that allows is that if the considering that the diagnostic codes is following a a schematic a standard approach that would allow to uh, describe the disease activity, not only in that particular case, but over time, over peak flows, over geographies, and all, all, all that. And it also allow, since it's a, it's a standardized code, code in, a, in a database, it allows people to associate that with productivity and, or other, cl and other clinical uh, outcomes to be able to measure the impact of these emerging or endemic diseases as they hit their flows, right? So that's all uh, creating more tools for for the vet. But uh, it's uh, like li like you said at the at the end, the quality of that data is positively correlated with the quality of the material that's received and how that uh, 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 explains or how that reflects the the overall population. So really good to reminder for people to follow standard operation procedures to select that animal in or the tissue and send back so that uh, whatever information it's, in it's going to be in the database, it, it's got to have a good internal validity to that flow rate. 
Dr. Linares, that is exactly what I meant to say. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and, and again, I think uh, the value of this will be illustrated over time. You know, I can imagine the equivalent of SPC charting uh, of diagnostic code data over time along with the SDRS system of detection of agents over time, uh, particularly if we start to standardize our submission and monitoring and surveillance practices as well as our diagnostic submission practices. Uh, I think larger populations and the impact, economic impact of disease uh, can more than warrant a little bit of testing to try to better understand and control. Um, I just hope the economics of swine production allow us to keep pushing that envelope forward. Well, thank you very much. That was a uh, very good discussion, conversation. Anything else, Edison, Giovanni, Dr. Schwartz? No, I thank you for the opportunity to, to share. And uh, if anybody has questions, uh, get in touch with your diagnosticians or, or our laboratory, and we can start to share some of the ideas uh, for improving how you can, uh, or, well, ideas to improve the animal health, or better yet, animal diseases and disease monitoring that's out there. All right. Thank you very much. And so thanks for listening. See you uh, next time for the Report 26 in March. Have a good time. Thank you. Thank